so right now, I'm um, excited to say that we, we actually have launched a service where patients can go into partners of ours um, in the world of, of aesthetic medicine, so plastic surgeons, dermatologists, uh, and have uh, samples taken and cryopreserved. So essentially, we freeze them in liquid nitrogen, okay. stop them from aging, and so you'll forever have that date of when you did that. You'll have those cells at that age available to you into the future. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Technology of Beauty, where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and the shakers of the beauty business. And today is truly no exception. Today, I have my friend Drew Taylor, who is the CEO and founder of Acorn Biolabs, right? Absolutely. And where'd you come from today? Uh, I just flew in from Toronto. Canada. That's what I heard. Yeah. I heard. So he's flown down from Toronto. And uh, I've been so looking forward to having Drew here in, in Manhattan Beach in our studios. And I'd like you all to learn about Acorn, which is so exciting. So stay tuned. First of all, Drew, where are you from? So I, I grew up in Toronto. Uh, I am Canadian. Uh, spent about nine years down in the States uh, for university and a little bit beyond. And, and then ended up uh, back up in the Great White North. Where did you go to university? University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. I did my undergrad and my master's there uh, in molecular cell developmental biology. And uh, I was going to head off to medical school. Um, that was the plan. I'd been accepted and was excited to, uh, to head off. But uh, I had a, a bit of a diversion. Uh, I got offered a, a professional baseball contract from my hometown team, the Toronto Blue Jays. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't do the MD and that at the same time. I, I asked, but... They, right. they said no. So I ended up uh, uh, convincing them to let me do a PhD at the same time. And so while I was playing in uh, the off seasons, uh, I did a PhD in biomedical engineering at the University of Toronto. Okay. And you played for the Blue Jays? Well, I, I certainly gave it a shot. Uh, I played about three years in the minor leagues um, uh, with the Blue Jays and also the Phillies. Uh, had a great run. Unfortunately, could have used some regenerative medicine back then. I had a, a labral tear and uh, a super spernatus sprain that, uh, that really slowed things down for me. What position did you play? I was a pitcher. Uh huh. So three years in the minors with the Blue Jays and uh, who, who was the other team? Uh, the Phillies, the Philadelphia. Phillies. And then, and you got your PhD during that time. I did. Yeah. And your PhD was in biomedical engineering, or, or is yeah, in, excuse and, me. Yeah, and specialized in uh, regenerative medicine and stem cell biology. So it was it was a, a greater focus on essentially engineering um, connective tissues. Wonderful. Yeah. And that was in Toronto. It's in Toronto. And have you stayed there continuously? Since that point in time, or did you leave Toronto again? I've stayed there continuously since then. So after um, uh, part of my work was done at the at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, and so oh. I continued on with them in the division of orthopedics actually for for a brief amount of time doing cartilage regeneration. Okay. Uh, and then I ended up uh, getting an offer that was difficult to turn down, but um, I joined in a. a, a essentially a venture capital firm that was investing in healthcare companies. And so I served as a chief science officer for them, uh, led diligence on about 28 different investments into the healthcare landscape. And it was a great opportunity to learn how to really take some of these discoveries and, and these innovations and actually take them to market and, and make real companies out of them. That's exciting. And what company was that you were working for? It was called Epic Capital Management. And where were they based out of? Toronto. Yeah. And you did 28 acquisitions or investments? So investments, yeah. About okay. 28 investments into the healthcare landscape. Some, you know, um, some obviously we had, had bigger stakes in than others, but about 28 deals came across our desk that we, we reacted to. And were they in your area of expertise? Not all of them. Some of them. Um, you know, there's, there's absolutely was a number of fantastic companies that were in, you know, cell-based medicine and bioengineering and things of that nature. But, you know, we did a number of, of different groups that was in dig digital health, um, you know, uh, disability and access to healthcare uh, companies that were really kind of um, formatting a way for, for people that have certain disabilities to receive better care and, and, you know, more identifiable in the system, things like that. Um, so it was, a, it was a fantastic run. I really it sounds it. exciting. Yeah. yeah. And then when did you spin off and start Acorn? So I ended up getting approached by two individuals, um, my, my co-founders at, uh, at Acorn. Um, and they were a little bit younger than me, but had uh, been kind of directed towards some of my research that I had done during my PhD. On, on some of the limitations 
and, and pathways to actually use our own cells as the starting material in regenerative medicine strategies. And so they actually approached me, and, and I think it was, it was kind of an open uh, opportunity to engage with them, I, you know, a little bit of mentoring, um, which led to me really committing more and more time to, to the work, uh-huh. um, helping to design some of the experiments that were running through the university at that time. Um, and then it led to some really, really interesting discoveries that we ended up uh, spinning out, patenting, and, uh, and forming ACORN officially. Were you working for or with the university at those early days? You think so that? I was, and I was outside of the university at that time. Um, and it was actually the University of Waterloo, um, which is a fantastic engineering school and has, has a really great biotech and, and uh, bioengineering program. Um, but uh, they were both at that university. My background being at, at U of T, I was still in Toronto. So we were uh-huh. kind of going down the highway back and forth and, uh, and working together routinely. Did the university co-sponsor or fund any of these efforts? So uh, University of Waterloo is a very in- interesting school. Um, they actually have an inventor-owned mandate on all IP. Okay. And so we were very comfortable continuing the work. I mean, obviously I wasn't a member of the university, but really appreciate the way that they set themselves up. Um, we were able to continue doing some great foundational work at the university in the early days, uh-huh. um, which really helped us to optimize, right, the amount of, of you know, access that we had to uh, lab space and equipment sure. and, and get some great data uh, and still also maintain the IP as part of the company. And the independence, right? Yeah, well, it's very attractive to investors because there's no royalties, you know, there's no, no skimming, right? It's, uh, it's 100% owned. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I don't know how they do it, but that's an offline discussion. Well, they, they've got a few things, and, and a lot of the, the uh, entrepreneurs are very committed at donating back to the university. Good. And they make commitments for, uh, should there be an exit one day, that they, they support the process that supported them. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. And, mm-hmm. and have they actually lived up to that commitment? As far as I can tell, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, there's a, there's a broad spectrum of, of successes and how mm-hmm. much, you know, of, of the support gets paid back to the university. But um, it's a very successful program. It's a fantastic school. And they've been leaders in, in Canada for the creation of IP because of that. So it's really facilitated things. Okay. So walk us through what happened next. <laughs> um, so we ended up actually um, landing in the Mars building, which is kind of like the innovation and healthcare hub in Toronto. Okay. Um, and it's a great place to be. You've got some major, you know, University of Toronto right there. Most of the major Canadian or Toronto hospitals are right in that, that area. So that, that 2.5 square kilometers is actually the co- highest concentration of healthcare workers in the world, I believe, that okay. concentrated. Okay. So it is an awesome place to be. And that's where we kind of incubated the company, continued running experiments. Uh, we were accepted into a innovation program that was run by Johnson & Johnson called J-Labs. Mm-hmm. And uh, we moved into lab space and office space in J-Labs at Mars. And we continued, uh, continued our work. And? Yeah. <laughs> and? <laughs> and then what? <laughs> yeah. So we made a, a few key discoveries. And, and I think that if we go back to what what the fundamental idea was that brought the three of us together. Uh Um, It was that our cells are a tremendous resource for us. Uh, And those those cells are are gonna be integral in regenerative medicine. We're not manufacturing chemical compounds in a laboratory in regenerative medicine. We need a live human cell to deliver Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And so whether we're using that live human cell to create the proteins, right, or the growth factors that we need, or using the live cells themselves and delivering that benefit back to the patient, the cell is the key. And so therefore you need a starting material that is alive. Uh, Ideally, from a rejection perspective, if you can have a patient's own cells, it is always the best course of action because you don't have to put patients on immunosuppressants and all of these other concerns. And in the world of aesthetics or sports medicine, you wouldn't even take donor cells because of the rejection risk, right? Right, It's not, the stakes aren't high enough. No. Um, So what we really innovated around was, was an accessible way of taking a sample from a patient that was practically non-invasive, painless, and quite cost-effective to do so that we could actually deliver this to people at scale and hopefully prepare the generations alive today for the advances in regenerative medicine that we're experiencing in our lifetime. Okay. Yeah. And so with that, you went for another source of the cell, correct? We did. Um, And so when we were working on cartilage, um, we had done some very successful animal studies uh, that predated me joining the, the group at Mount Sinai. And when I came in, the role was to translate that work into to human models. So I was going into the OR, 
I got my clinic fix, which I was very excited about as, <laughs> as a diversion PhD student. Um, I was taking the sample in the OR, bring it back to the lab to see if in practice we could grow out those, those cells to create the functional tissues that would one day be necessary to deliver us back our cartilage and focal defects or even all the way up to arthroplastic surgery. And were you taking cartilage samples? We were taking cartilage samples at the time. Okay. Yeah. We looked at MSCs, we looked at IPSCs, which was very early days for that. Um, but we, we analyzed a number of different cell sources as well as fibroblasts. Okay. So a lot of different connective tissues, really, that we were targeting to see which would be the best tissue types. But also um, what, what we really uncovered during that work, as you can imagine, if I'm going in during arthroplastic surgery to take the sample, we've got quite a specific demographic of people. Right. And so most of the patients were elderly had you know <laughs> compounding conditions like osteoarthritis or, or damage or trauma and things and and because we were at a, a you know a great institution a fantastic hospital we did get some of the complex cases so more and more we got younger patients even you know i was in on a surgery where we did a knee replacement on a 16 year old right wow. so you end up seeing um all of the different kind of timelines in a patient's life and what was clear as day is that when we got the initial batch through of the older patients we weren't able to replicate the animal studies but when we started to get some of the younger cells, we could see the performance improving. Okay. And, and so we dove into that issue and, and found out that all of the animal studies that were run, all of the cell samples that we received were from juvenile animals. So essentially teenagers. Right. And now we're going to people that already have, you know, wear and tear for a lifetime, now taking those cells and asking them to perform again at their best. So in the human studies, we needed access to a younger cell to really be able to drive benefit. Okay. And so that was the big problem that we wanted to address, is how can we actually find a way to take a cell sample in advance? Because, you know, back at, at Sinai, I can remember us pushing tables together and kind of having these, these discussions about what uh, some of the courses of Avenue are to, to really tackle this problem. And the best idea that was thrown out, at least for me, was what if we just intercepted the aging process as early as possible and get that patient their best possible cells, which sure. is harvesting them today. And so the idea of, of prospectively you know, uh, cutting into the, the aging process and locking in that better sample at an earlier time point. And that's what we've created a solution around. Could you do it with cord blood? So cord blood is really interesting. And, and I, you know, I'll caveat this by saying that I have three kids at home. All of them have banked their cord blood. I am the epitome of somebody that believes in the power of cells and then being a resource for us in the future. Okay. That being said, there are some limitations with cord blood that we've experienced because it has been around for the better part of three decades. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the progress from both the scientists working on it and, and people that are engaging in that service, right, as, as customers, it's been a little over underwhelming. And one of the biggest hindrances is the fact that um, those cells don't expand well in culture. So however many cells you harvest is how many you get. Oh, they don't duplicate it's and replicate? No, it's, so it's actually the reason why the FDA and Health Canada have both mandated or only approved that the you know treatment of leukemia in children. It has nothing to do with the storage of the samples for long-term or anything. It's just that we really only get enough samples to definitively treat a child. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So that's the, rate, that's the limiting step, isn't it's it? It's the limiting step. And so what we want to do is target a cell source that is easily expandable. And okay. on top of that, for future technologies reprogrammable. So leveraging those those technologies that allow us to change an adult cell, right, mm -hmm. into a pluripotent stem cell, essentially resembling that magic moment when sperm meets egg and that cell can become anything in the body. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that's a long-term strategy. And that is not, you know, we're not going to see benefit delivered to patients overnight. But, you know, do I think 10 years from now, we're going to see some of the world's toughest diseases getting tackled with iPSC-based therapies? Absolutely. Right, right now, there are really amazing projects targeting things like macular degeneration, Parkinson's, a number of, of you know, debilitating diseases that we don't have good treatments for. You know, Parkinson's is an interesting example because in this very precise locus, we lose cellular activity, right? These right. dopaminergic neurons. Yes. Well, we can create those, right? At ACORN, in our lab, we've created the dopaminergic neurons for patients on demand from their hair follicles. Right? So it's going to take time to prove out the safety, safety and efficacy of these strategies, but they're coming in our lifetimes. And, and it's going to be a tremendous moment as we see these things start to integrate more and more into healthcare. So you just mentioned hair follicles. So why don't we share with the viewers and the we'll listeners. We'll get down to it, yeah. So where, where are you getting these well, pluripotential yeah. cells? 
Well, I, I already um, gave it away, but the, uh, the hair follicle turns out is uh, an incredible resource of cells. So um, it's probably the highest concentration of adult stem cells in such a small packed amount of space. In fact, we have the same stem cells in our hair follicles that we have in our bone marrow, mesenchymal stem cells. And so these are, are cells that are characteristically used across skin and orthopedics and sports medicine, right, as, as targets for different strategies. Um, and they're very robust. We can culture them and, and, and expand them and make more of them in culture. They're very hardy cells. Um, they can become cartilage, bone, fat. Um, we've shown that they can also become neurons if they're taken from the hair follicle. Um, us and another group have actually both shown that. So it is, it's, ex it's an exciting cell source. But ultimately what matters is it's accessible, right? You're not drilling into your bone marrow and harvesting you know, those cells. You're not doing liposuction even to harvest fat and then purifying it to try to get it at the right cells, the, right, the, the progenitor cells in your fat. You're going to the hair follicle and simply plucking it from the back of the scalp. So describe for everyone what a hair follicle is. I mean, I know you know, everyone knows what it's the base of the hair and so forth, but most of us think of hair as hair. Mm -hmm. And yet we hear the word hair follicle, that's something at the base of the hair. Describe what that looks like under a microscope or yeah. biologically. So, so the best way to describe it is really this, this sheath or the cell that, that is underneath the layer of the skin, right? And so it provides that opening where the hair fiber actually comes out of the skin. And it goes, you know, not very long, but millimeters deep into the, to the layer of the skin. And at the bottom of that, there's a cup. And on the side of it, there's a bit of a bulge of cells. And the cup cells, right, this dermal papilla is really where there's a lot of hair follicle specific stem cells, but then interspersed in the sheath around it and in the bulge region especially, we have those concentrations of mesenchymal stem cells. Okay. And because they're part of that sheath, you can actually from plucking get access to those cells quite easily. And then, do you treat the mesenchymal cells? Or the so, yeah, so right now, I'm um, excited to say that we, we actually have launched a service where patients can go into partners of ours um, in the world of, of aesthetic medicine, so plastic surgeons, dermatologists, uh, and have uh, samples taken and cryopreserved. So essentially, we freeze them in liquid nitrogen, okay. stop them from aging, and so you'll forever have that date of when you did that. You'll have those cells at that age available to you into the future. Are my cells, my hair follicle cells, the old hair follicle cells I have, are they less uh, effective than if I had harvested them when I was 20? Potentially. Yeah. 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 I mean, so all are, you, are we looking at maybe having uh, hair follicle banks like, like blood yes, banks? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, again, this is personalized, right? So you're, you're harvesting your own cells to use for yourself. And so we talked a lot about some of the really exciting future. Okay. But what is really we're at the doorstep of and some of these first applications are in the world of aesthetic medicine. And I think very shortly following that in sports medicine. Okay. And so right now these cells really are a resource for us. And so we know a bunch of the things that happen to our skin as we age, right? And, and we obviously see the results visually first because... We're looking at people. Right. Um, and so our collagen starts to, to reduce. We lose about 1% of collagen production every year of our lives after we hit 22 or whatever, right? Okay. Hyaluronic acid starts to, to drop. Um, and the number of adult stem cells that we have in all of the niches in our body start to, to decline as well. And okay. so the hair follicle is no different. It's ideal to do this as young as possible. But absolutely, we've taken follicles. We've got clients that are into their 80s, ultimately with the mindset of, I want to lock in my cells at 80 because they're going to be a lot healthier than they are at 90. <laughs> I'll be darn. And do they come into your clinic? Or how does what does this look like? It's like it sounds like you're banking blood, but it's hair. Yeah, no needle. It's, it's hair. So literally with a pair of tweezers, you're just plucking hair follicles from the back of the scalp. I don't know if anybody has, has plucked an eyebrow. I certainly have done some. Uh, otherwise, I'd probably look more like Eugene Levy. Uh -huh. Right, you. Uh, it's it's not uncomfortable. It's annoying, if anything. Um, it's certainly not painful. And so, in a very quick procedure, right? And I, and I, I use the procedure pretty lightly. Um, you can go into one of our partners. We partner with plastic surgeons, dermatologists, and people, um, you know, running medical practices to offer this. And how many do you pluck? We take fifty follicles. Uh -huh. Those follicles are then stored in four different vials. So we separate that sample to provide redundancy and the ability to draw upon that sample multiple times throughout your lifetime. Okay. Because you can multiply those cells, you have the potential of adding to that sample during 
a, a time when you're creating sure. a, a, a therapy and multiplying those cells. Um, and those, those stay there for you until you need them. And so you do that before you need them? Yes. And then they're, they're stored under uh, cold conditions, right? Yeah, liquid nitrogen. So just slightly warmer than the, the surface of Pluto, uh, negative, <laughs> negative 100 and, and around uh, negative 196 degrees Celsius. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and then have you actually used these? Do you have experience in this or is this hypothetical? So we do have experience in it. Obviously, we are working towards applying a multitude of different potential applications in patients. But um, I'm really excited that the, the work has progressed very, very quickly in the world of aesthetics. And we've actually completed now two preclinical trials on taking a patient population cells and using those cells to essentially be a resource you know, or a factory right. to produce a patient's own autologous growth factors, exosomes, and matrix molecules, the very things that unfortunately are starting to deplete with age. Right, and so we can deliver those back to the skin by by concentr- growing those cells in our laboratory and harvesting and harvesting them over a period of time, uh-huh. and then we can get this ultra rich concentrated serum that can be applied to patients. And then, how do you deliver it back to the patient? So we're we're going through a bunch of the the application uh, possibilities. We look at doing it alongside microneedling to get a little bit better absorption. So topical, topical to start. Do you yeah. inject it? We're working towards that. But again, once you start injecting, it's a little bit of a different regulatory pathway. I bet. Um, but again, there's major advantages here because this is a patient's own material. Now, there are other companies who have taken the patient's own blood, plasma, or parts of the blood, or fat, mm-hmm. and other body parts, and have somehow uh, grown growth factors mm-hmm. or exosomes or something that's a stimulator and then apply it, apply it topically. How is your technology better than or different than? Yeah, most, most technologies try to do it um, at the same time as treatment. Okay. okay. And it's that's for a very right. specific use, right? You're taking these stem yes. cells and you're trying to essentially deliver back concentrated growth factor. Right. And so we're taking cells that have, um, you know, the capacity to produce growth factors and we're looking at areas where they're easy to access. And fat is one of the, the good examples of it. And sure. blood plasma, because from either a simple liposuction or you know, a blood, um, draw. blood draw, you can get access to it and deliver it back to that patient. Mm-hmm. We compared ourselves to PRP, right? The blood draw version. Okay. And so in that situation, patient's blood uh, was drawn and their hair follicles were taken. We then prepped PRP for those patients, um, essentially concentrating the growth factors and, and platelets sure. in their blood into a concentrated sample. And then we also took the hair follicles and cultured out during our process to create their own autologous serum. Okay. Um, and so when we did that, we then sent it out to a third party proteinomics group, analyzing the proteins that were within so that we knew exactly what the levels of growth factor and, and all of these different elements were. And look, at the results were exciting. I mean, we were looking for a percentage kind of fold higher, but uh-huh. we ended up with massive multiples higher of some things that are pretty essential. So fibronectin, a, a great um, protein that is involved in wound healing, you know, we had 34 times higher levels of fibronectin than was in PRP. Wow. 23 times higher VGF than was in PRP. 13 times higher IGF-1 that was in PRP. And this was an independent lab that analyzed Independent this? lab, so it was done third party. Yeah, we wanted to make sure that this was delivered to us. And <coughs> on your end of the spectrum, you, you did the hair follicles, you harvested them from the, mm-hmm. your pa- the patients, yep. evidently. And yeah. then did your process, did the, it was fresh going straight over from, it was, fresh it was going never straight frozen? Over. It was, it was, so it was frozen. Um, so we've, we, we did freeze, right? And so, but we're uh, treating all of the things equivalently, right? So you're going to get the same, same treatment on every side. Uh-huh. Um, you have to, to treat the samples to batch them together and send them out. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when we look at, at some of these uh, deliverables, the growth factors, the proteins, right, these are going to be you know, there's collagen, glycoprotein, like large proteins that are also in this. They're, they're very good at stabilizing uh, exosomes and small proteins that are around them. Hmm. And so, you know, what we're looking at right now is actually being able to lyophilize this so that you can have a nice shelf life and be able to deliver this to patients over time. Mm-hmm. Because the other thing we didn't talk about is the PRP is one draw, one treatment. Yep. When we prep this for patients, we had enough volume to still keep that concentration above PRP, you know, when it's going head to head. Okay. But have 12 vials of this lined up for that to patient. To use it in the future? Yeah. 
Could this be potentially a skincare line? I think so. I think right now what we're doing is we're working with some some you know fantastic uh, you know leaders in the space to help us design you know the right way to apply these to patients. Because what we've done is we've created something very exciting, right? We have the ability to deliver back uh, matrix molecules, you know, autologous exosomes, which you know is you don't hear very often, mm-hmm. um, and and growth factor back to a patient, right, of their own material. So very limited risk, right? The same same things we're excited about PRP, uh-huh. right. Um, and so ultimately, there's there's a lot of applications in the same way that we're using PRP. Like PRP is used now across aesthetic medicine, sports medicine, dentistry. It's now used in fertility at, at some sites, right? It has a lot of applications. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're struggling with that same problem that we're trying to hone in on some of the best avenues to deliver benefit to patients in aesthetic medicine. Um, hypothetically, if you were going to apply this to the skin and hope to have transcutaneous penetration, mm-hmm. Couple questions. Uh, number one, are the molecules big enough, or in this case, small enough, to go through the skin without a vehicle? Not all of them. Okay. Right? So candidly, you know, when when we look at at collagens and elastin and some of these larger macromolecular structures, including you know fibronectin, can be very sticky and bind mm-hmm. to other things. You're going to have a tough time getting them across the barrier of the skin. They can sit on the surface and provide some benefit there, but it's not getting into the skin. And so that's why we use mechanisms to open up the skin and allow and for better the, absorption. The microdermabrasion, right? Mi- the micro- yeah, microneedling. Me, we look at it post laser, right? You know, a number of these things. But because of you know high levels of fibronectin, we're excited to test out wound healing, like post sure. elective plastic surgery procedure. You know, putting this along the lines to to really fight. You know, fibronectin is known for for really being one of the primary elements that aligns collagen fibers accurately and inhibits scar tissue formation. So when you do transcutaneous or tr- percutaneous, thus you're looking for transcutaneous penetration, how deep are you trying to get this, these molecules? Yeah, so these molecules can benefit, obviously, the surface of the skin as well as, as the subdermis, right? And, and there are absolutely elements of this that benefit both the keratinocytes and fibroblasts underneath. Okay. And so we, we, we are looking to apply this for benefit topically, right? And we think that it's going to do a great job at, at helping the surface layer of your skin. But... There is some some massive opportunities on getting this deeper. So into the fibroblasts yep. and the interstitium. Yep. Uh, would any of it go subdermal? Is there any efficacy to that? Or so I mean, it's an interesting question, obviously, right? So when when we look at some of the uh, um, areas, there's certainly potential applications that you can think of. We're focused right now on stain within the dermis. Sure. Right. Um, but absolutely, I think there's some avenues to look at going going deeper. Have you ever heard of Brian Beal? I'm sorry, Ryan Beal? Yep. And Dive? Yeah. Okay. So we, we've had a, a great chat, and I think that there's a, a, a potential opportunity there of, of collaborating. I, uh, I think they've got fantastic technology. Um, I think it's a technology that we can we can supercharge ours with, right, and provide benefit for for patients that want a, a, a deeper, right, or physicians that want to deliver a deeper application. Um, we, we do think that, you know, in the first wave of things, by applying this topically onto patients alongside microneedling and, and post laser, I think we're really excited to see those results uh-huh. and then start to work with uh, with groups like that to to really deliver the next generation of the product. Yeah, it seems like kind of a no brainer to me. He was on the program yeah. and a great guy, uh, uh, a physician, a scientist, uh, great technology. I would think the two of you might come together at least put your active uh, ingredients, if you will, on the backs of his uh, camels, if you will, or mobilizers that can drive it down through the skin in ways that I just couldn't believe until he exposed me to it. Yeah, I think you're spot on. Uh, Wouldn't that be cool if we could get big molecules through the epidermis, the cornified epidermis, the epidermis, and down to the dermal and intradermal layers? I would think there'd be terrific uh, opportunities there. Absolutely. um, That's for you to look into yeah. so um besides aesthetics you mentioned ortho yep. share with us what you're thinking about you're you're a major league pitcher and an athlete tell me what you're thinking about yeah i think this is a you know fundamentally the first step of acorn we're very excited about the aesthetic treatments and sure. there's going to be a ton of attention around them but at its base right what acorn is doing is is really securing your cells agnostic to how you want to use them in the future it may be aesthetics, 
right? And you may want to leverage them there. But also, you know, 10 years from now or 20 years from now, you might have a different priority. But you'll still have your cells from that age stored and able to be leveraged in those different avenues. So Could you, you grow an organ? Could you grow my liver or my pancreas? Or? I, I am extremely hopeful that, uh, that we're alive to see the first 3D printed organ from a patient's banked younger cells implanted into a patient, absolutely. So one of, one of the big studies that we have that's going on with um, University of Toronto and Mount Sinai Hospital um, is we've actually taken the, the cells from patients, cultured them out, and, and uh, reprogrammed them to iPSCs. We then took those iPSCs, and in the first wave of that, that work, we, we differentiated them down to three different germ layers to show that they had the potential of becoming any cell. Uh-huh. And then we just picked a, a disease, right, a modality that we wanted to investigate. And we happened to pick diabetes. Okay. My brother is a type 1 diabetic at 10, you know, developed this and, and uh, you know, he's been doing great, but obviously, like, it was on the top of my mind. So the pancreas was chosen, and, and we were able to create pancreas cells on demand for patients. That, pro- that work is continuing now, and, and we're going to be publishing that work later this year, but um, we're going to continue the second phase of it where we're actually going to start collecting insulin from those cells. And so it's, it's a really, um, you know, with the idea of, of putting that into an animal model to make sure that we can actually do that, right, in vivo. Sure. And so these, these targets of using our own cells that have higher potential because they're younger and haven't been exposed to a lifetime of wear and tear and disease uh-huh. um, in the aging process, um, we can use those cells for aesthetics, for sports medicine, for disease management, and one day 3D printing you a new organ. That is absolutely amazing. So <clears throat> how do you harvest these hair cells? I, you mentioned tweezers a minute ago. Yeah. You mentioned 50 hair follicles. Yeah. Uh, is this simple as like if I just pull out a hair? Is it that simple? You have to, you have to get the root. And well, how does, does the root, if I pull out my hair, does the root come out with it? It, it should, right? So if you're pulling it in the same direction of growth yeah. and it is an antigen phase follicle, you will get that, that root. How do I know if it's an antigen, antigen phase well, follicle? Well, we know that. And so we work with our, our partners to ensure that before they ship them out to us for, for cryo So they're plucking one by one for 50 of them? Probably get, more than 50 because you have to you probably get some duds, don't you? You do get some duds, right, for sure. Yeah. And some people get no duds. Some people have more than others, right? It uh-huh. really just depends. Um, but it's a pretty quick process. Like, you know, this is a 15-minute, you know, kind of swing through. It's No anesthesia? No anesthesia is necessary, no. That is unbelievable. Yeah. So you're plucking our hairs, mm-hmm. you're you're storing them, uh, and the and the coldness of Pluto. Yeah. This sounds Almost. like a science fiction movie. It does. Uh, it and does. And then and then you pull them back out of the cold of Pluto, almost cold of Pluto. Yeah. And then you turn them into my pancreas. That's right. Because at that temperature, when they're frozen and it's that cold, there's zero metabolism. So okay. The, so those cells are literally frozen in time. So they're not accumulating damage. They're not aging. They're identical to when you froze them down in that, that moment. You mentioned you have three children. I do. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you. Have you stored their hair? Absolutely. You have? Absolutely. You brought your kids in, plucked 50 hairs or more, and put them in the freezer. And they did not complain once. <laughs> and I, I mean, I'd like to say they're tough, but this is pretty easy, right? You know, the littlest was, uh, si- uh, he's six now. We did this when he was five. Um, and he sat there pleased as punch to be, to be, you know, getting Oh, you bribed him. I know you did. Well, we had Netflix on, did right? You, Just watching you, a cartoon. Oh, there you go. You brought this box. Show us what's in it. Yeah, And this is what sure. the physicians like myself would purchase from you? Yeah, absolutely. So physicians carry this in, in their office, and basically inside there's everything that you need to do a collection. The only thing that's missing is a vial, and that's the only temperature-controlled part of this. Okay. Right? So this sits outside of the fridge, and then we have a row of vials for you inside the fridge. And you just pull one of those and a kit, and you've got everything you need. Basically, you've got tweezers, and you know I affectionately call these Patrick tweezers. They are, are very ergonomic, nice to use. We actually get emails to customer service asking where we can get more of these because they are quite good uh-huh. at plucking uh, eyebrows and things. Um, and so this is where you just pluck the sample from the back of the scalp. Um, there's a pair of, of fine uh, scissors, and this is just if for people with longer hair, just to cut because the hair itself, the keratin, is useless. We're after the cells at the very tip. Oh, good point. Yeah. So we don't need all the hair. So if you've got long hair, you just cut off and as long as we've got a little bit to grab and the, and the root that's fine um, you know and the rest of the things are just for convenience a hair clip 
in case uh-huh. you've got longer hair. And then just some fine tweezers if you need any help putting them into the vial. And then a vial holder that allows you to stand up the vial while you're doing it. And the physician buys this uh, box of instruments. Absolutely, yeah. So physicians are carrying this right now. And we're, we're excited. We, we launched um, really to kind of test out uh, the market in Canada in April of last year. Um, it was received extremely well. Um, it was really a, a great run for us over the past year of, of looking at this in Canada. And so we just have finished building out our facility in Los Angeles and launching in the U.S. And so there's locations right now in L.A., Newport Beach, and we're adding other locations in uh, Colorado, um, Phoenix. Um, we've got uh, Pennsylvania, and then we're also talking with uh, clinics to, to onboard in the next uh, month in uh, both New York and, and Florida. That's wonderful. Now, uh, the physician does this and that's the service at the physician's office then do the people pay a subscription to you or a a yearly or monthly fee exactly so the physician would charge a a fee to do the procedure for the patient and get their cells that that one time thing that you need to do right Um, and then you enter a subscription with acorn to keep those cells cryogenically stored and so if if you're watching netflix at home we've referenced it before you can afford to do this um it's 190 dollars a year for an individual and we've got family plans so that you can save a ton of money by doing families together Uh uh-huh and then so that's the storage part Mm -hmm. and then at at certain time t0 actually or not zero it's the new time i don't know what t1 uh and now we need the cells Mm -hmm. And then do we pay you to go into this cryo thing and Pluto and pull them out? Well, really it depends on what, what you're doing, right? If you're making this topical serum application, you know, you're paying us to make that for you. Sure. Right. Okay, and so I there's going to be like with any other treatment, right? With any other thing that you're doing, either microneedling or, or laser and whatever the adjuvant you're using or, or serum, um, there's going to be a, a fee. We look at trying to be comparable to PRP. Okay. Right? So we want to be... Um, essentially the next evolution in regenerative medicine applications. Um, and, and look at a lot of people have, have gotten a lot of value out of PRP. Sure. So other people, the critique, it's inconsistency and aren't in love with it. Um, and different patients have different uh, reactions. And ultimately that's one of the things about PRP is that it is variable, right? It depends heavily on that patient's age, their current health, their diet lately, a lot of different things because you're essentially just concentrating their blood. Right. By taking the cells and storing them, Right, you're locking an age. Mm-hmm. So you've got that consistent for the rest of that patient's life. Sure. And then by culturing out those cells in our laboratory, we can actually control the volumes of these things that we're producing to get to those higher levels. And even for patients that are starting to age, um, or patients that, you know, aren't in as good of health as the other, you know, for whatever reason, by culturing out those cells we can mitigate against some of those weaknesses and actually create them a, a really great product. And the cost will be according to what they need. For instance, if I need a pancreas versus if I need a a cartilage, right? I can't imagine my pancreas is going to be as cheap as a a or some skincare. Yeah. 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 So I mean, ultimately, yeah, everything's going to be different, right? What we're talking about right now is using these cells to create that that skincare application and also hair care application. We're looking at for for um, um, androgenic alopecia and some other conditions of of uh, you know obviously us losing the, the production of hair. And have you tried that? Do you have any studies going on right now? So for those, are, those are upcoming. What we started with was was essentially trying to to uh, have these cells um, invigorate the skin cells, right? And so the the second preclinical. So we talked about that first one where we compared to PRP. Yes. The second one we ran was actually a uh, wound healing model. And so we'll we'll get into hair hopefully in the next next study. But the wound healing one was really interesting. We took skin cells from patients and we cultured them in the laboratory, essentially creating a sheet of their skin cells confluent sure. in a dish. Sure, like we do for burn patients. Right. And then we took a scalpel and we scraped the scalpel across the surface of those cells, essentially creating an artificial wound. Wound. Okay. Okay. Um, and then in in one uh, arm, we ended up using a standard growth media that we know works very well in these cells to promote growth, development, and, and division. And then we added 10% of our serum into that. And after 48 hours, we increased the wound healing um, of that, that defect by 3.5 times with our serum. So, I mean, look at, in, you know, preclinical work. It's amazing. But very exciting, right? When, yeah. And we, we can't say. wait to, to apply this to patients because the, the results were, were uh, you know, ahead of even our predictions. 
So it created, if you will, a type of an abrasion. It wasn't a thermal engine, it wasn't a burn, but you denuded yeah, the them. Phys phys you, physical erasion, right? Physical Using a scalpel abrasion. across the surface. Yeah. And you only put 10% in and you had a 3.5 times? Yeah. And, and again, right, this is this is cells that are being cultured in a, in a media, right? And so we're yeah, adding... Yeah, a known media that yeah, promotes cell growth. Exactly. Right, so when you're applying this to your skin, obviously you've got more three-dimensional skin, right? It's going to be more cells that you're targeting. And so we're, we're working through, like, concentrations and things right now of, of the application. You know, some of the same critiques around PRP. We've got a little bit of an advantage there on trying to be more accurate with, with what we're, we're delivering. And so we're working through those things right now. But obviously the skin, when you apply this to your face, is going to be thicker. But yeah. Absolutely remarkable. Yeah, it's exciting. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you haven't told us? I'm sure there's tons. Your home offices Plenty. are still in Toronto. So we've got offices you, now in, in both. So we're, we're LA. yeah, we're both in LA and Toronto. Um, and uh, look, I, I think that we're going to be growing in uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, pretty quick here. We're just getting going in the U.S. So it is it's a very exciting time for us, and we've gotten a lot of interest from, uh, um, you know, to use your words, some of the movers and the shakers in the industry. <laughs> yeah, I, that's understandable. Let me tell you. Well, I'd love to experience it if I could. Uh, Absolutely. If there's any way I could talk you into harvesting 50 uh, hairs, for, uh, hair follicles, sorry, yeah. not hairs. Yeah, You'll absolutely. probably have to have 100 hairs for me to get 50 androgenic follicles. No, <laughs> well, like, you, you've got a fantastic head of hair. You're going to be getting them very quick. Okay. I've, I've done this enough times I can tell. You can? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, well, we'll need to try that. Let's do it. That's great. Okay. We'll, we'll get you frozen in time, and, and part of you will never age again. Darn, I wish I'd have done this about 40 years ago. Me too. <laughs> but, you know, it's available now, and that's all we can do. Wow, is this exciting. Yeah. Unbelievable. This is like a science fiction. It's well, unbelievable. It, it's exciting. And, and, you know, we've been very quiet, and so this is a tremendous opportunity, you know, to share this with you. Right. Yes, so thank well, you for this. I appreciate the opportunity to share it with me and to share it with our guests uh, and the world. No, it's, you guys are changing things, and that's wonderful. It's our privilege. So thank, thank you very you. much, Drew. Thank you. Well, what do I say? Is that not a mover and shaker of the beauty business right there? So I'm going to try to talk Drew into harvesting some hair follicles from me here before he leaves to go back to Toronto. And I want to thank you all for joining me on the Technology of Beauty, where clearly I have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business. Be sure to stay tuned to all the developments of ACORN and see us every Tuesday. Take care.